Uh, hello, everybody. So this is work that I have done, and we actually have a paper, and as soon as I get comments back from my co-authors, uh, Deborah Pace and Kim Childs, uh, we're gonna send it off to a journal. Uh, so it's uh, with a group of teacher leaders and a couple of NSF grants that we've had for several years. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the need for teacher leaders and the situation in East Texas to begin with. Uh, the way uh, teacher leaders improve instruction, okay? And by a teacher leader, I mean a teacher who is in a school or a school district, who is a practicing teacher, but also capable of leading uh, professional development. Uh, they provide quality staff uh, development and not just the latest trends, because they've been doing this a long time. Uh, the uh, situation in East Texas, uh, or in Texas in general, it's divided up so you have educational service centers. Uh, if you're in a large school district like Houston or Dallas, you know, you're, you have uh, the expertise right near you, but if you're a small rural district in East Texas, this educational uh, service center may be 100 miles away. So this sort of helps to solve that problem. Okay, um, since they're practitioners, they provide a lot of extra credibility. Okay, and they can target specific needs within a district, which is something that educational service centers can't really do as well. Okay, and finally, they can go across grade level. So. So we had, uh, over the past uh, half dozen years, two NSF programs, and one was the Texas Leadership Initiative, and that was uh, a supplement to an uh, MSP grant, and the second one was a NOICE grant, uh, I believe, and that was the Texas Limit. There were 10 teachers in the first one. All of them were highly qualified and had a master's in mathematics or mathematics education, and 16 teachers in the second one, and they were divided uh, about half and half between middle school and high school. Um, and, but their mathematical expertise was good enough where they could talk to each other, and we had actually some who were uh, coaches or teaching in elementary school, but they were qualified to teach at higher levels. Okay, so the goals of this thing were, were to develop highly qualified teachers, and we call them master teachers, uh, teaching fellows in our program, uh, to provide you know, expertise in differentiated instruction, uh, to provide training and quality professional development, okay, uh, to assist in the creation of modules and uh, that, that they could use among themselves because they actually where it became a community of professional developers, okay, where they could exchange. Uh, and we wanted a framework to how do you train teacher leaders. So a little bit about more about the participants, okay. Uh, you can see that uh, all of them had experience at various levels, some at multiple levels. We've had people who've been able to teach, who've taught at middle school, high school, and you know, the university, you know, first year university, and so on. So this doesn't add up to 26. And actually, when we sampled these, we had 20 remaining teachers because we lost some, some dropped out of the program for various reasons, some retired, and so on. Okay. By time, uh, there were just, uh, you can see that very few had less than 10 years and a lot had more than 20 years of experience. So they were very experienced. Uh, so the structure of the two programs, the leadership and limit programs, uh, since the two grants overlapped, we often had them work together. Uh, they came in once a month uh, and for several extended periods over a summer. Uh, and we did various things with them, uh, which I'll describe later on. Okay, so what I really want to do is tell you how IBL fits into this. The one thing is that uh, 
if you look at professional development and you're training teacher leaders to become professional developers, that is professional development. Okay. What people are going to do if you do short-term professional development is they take the ideas that you give them, and there's quite a bit of research to back this up, and they try and fit it into the framework of what they already know. Okay. So it needs to be long-term. And if you're going to make a transformation, they're going to have to balance a uh, question this balance between what they already know and what you're, where you're trying to bring them. So imagine that these are well-qualified teachers, but not really good professional developers. Okay, you start talking to them, and they'll say, "Well, my students do this, and my students can do this, or they can't do this, or this is how you treat students." And you want to change their mindset to, okay. Your clients are no longer your students. Your clients are your colleagues. Okay, so they have to wrap their head around this, and it took several years to get this, uh, and we're still working on it. So one of the ways to do this is what's called cognitive dissonance, and so they're going to have to. Uh, one of the um, cognitive dissonance is this idea that. You get these two conflicting ideas and, in your head, and um, you have to re uh, so you've been doing things a certain way. You come along, you're presented with something that upsets the apple cart. Okay? And so you hold these conflicting ideas in your head. This is a well-established uh, th theory in psychology. And then you have to look at it and you say, okay, I've got to you know, reconcile these two ideas, and that makes them open to a transformative change. Once you've created this cognitive dissonance, you can have them start to think about this change, and they'll be open to new ways, and they're, especially the fact that there might be a better way of doing things. So our research questions were the following. Okay. Can you use IBL, okay, to create this cognitive dissonance within uh, prospective teacher leaders? Okay, and the second question is, okay, um, are they able to make the uh, transformation, and how much did uh, IBL uh, contribute to this? So we did uh, lots of things in, over the several years of these projects. But I want to give you four examples of IBL activities that the teachers engaged in. The first one was seeing some IBL in action, and that was uh, analyzing classroom video, and I'll show you a clip in just a minute. Okay. The second one was exploring new mathematics okay, uh, in an IBL format, and one of the things that we did there was taxicab geometry. Third thing was creating an IBL lesson and engaging in a cycle of lesson study uh, where the teachers would work together and create a lesson and uh, give it to a real class, present it to a real class. One of the teachers would do this, the rest would observe. And then finally, uh, leading an IBL session uh, in a case study. So all these are, in some sense, uh, inquiry-based learning. Now, what we didn't do is, when we question these teachers, is give them a definition of IBL. We let them make their own definition. So let's look at uh, classroom video. So one of the classroom, uh, this classroom videos, we had the money to bring Stan Yoshinobu to campus and present a workshop one Saturday. And he brought some videos from Heinemann. And one of these videos was, of a third grade class, and it was called Turkey Investigations. And I don't, has anybody seen these? Okay, so they're very, very rich. Uh, and third, grade, third graders, they don't know much about, they can add, but they can't multiply three digit numbers. So the teacher comes in, and it's two classes. In the first class, uh, she sa tells the class that I need to invite everybody over for Thanksgiving dinner, and I have all these people. and. I need to go buy a turkey, and I'm going to buy a 24-pound turkey, and it's $1.25 a pound. How much money do I need to take to the supermarket? And then the day the next class, she comes back, and she says, I bought the turkey. Here's my favorite cookbook. 
it takes 15 minutes a pound to cook this turkey, how long do I need to cook it? So there is a multiplication problem in the first one, there's a multiplication problem in the second one, and a division problem because they're gonna come up with 360 minutes and immediately she's gonna say, well, how many hours is that? Okay, so they've got to uh, invent strategies to do this. Um, you said you have the 24 tens, right? So how many fives do you need? Now you need, how are you going to add all those fives on? I was thinking we could do, um, put um, 24 fives in the each one, and then add the other one. I don't know why we did five. What do you think? Why didn't you tell why you didn't just count by five? Yeah. Well, now it you would be better. We out of Well, I'm thinking of something. You, you have t you have 24 groups of 10 here, right? Do you have any? Now you need 24 groups of five. How could you do that? Well, we could take. How much is a group of four or fives? Twenty. Okay. And so how many groups of four or fives would you need? And then you would have to circle it. Then you'd have to circle it so we and put... No, we won't have to put a one. Then we would have to put twenty. And then go on forty. On sixty. And on. How would you know when to stop, though? That's what I want to know. How many fives do you need? Um, 24. So I want to know how many, how, how high are you going to get if you have all 24 fives down? I'm going to come check on you. You guys have a really good idea here. Yeah? Okay, so that's about the end of this little clip. The entire video runs about 30 or 40 minutes, and it's a snapshot into the two classrooms. Okay, so two things are going on here. Whoever this teacher is, she's a master, okay? Because you notice she never gave an answer. She kept asking questions. And the students, third graders, they divided up into tens and fives. These students knew the distributive law, okay? My uh, freshman uh, elementary ed majors, they're not sure why they need to know the distributive law. This is evidence, and I actually show this video to them. The teachers who saw this, our workshop teachers, love this. And one of the teachers went back to her school district and says, I want to do this in my classroom and, you know, for professional, and do professional development. And the response from her supervisor was, well, our teachers wouldn't really believe that their students could do this. So why don't you make a video of our students trying to do this, which I thought was, was great. Okay. So one of the other things that we did was taxicab geometry. Uh, and you can think of a metric, not the Euclidean metric, but the distance between uh, points as you drive like a taxi cab. Okay. So, you know, a circle looks something like the diamond in the bottom. And pi is no longer an irrational number, okay? Pi actually happens to be four, okay? And you can start leading the teachers through this, and you can say, well, what's pi, okay? What do circles look like? What do ellipses look like? What do hyper... You can do all the conic sections, and it gets very tricky, okay? So we spent uh, probably two Saturdays working on that, two half of uh, Saturdays, and they presented their answers and so on. So we were actually trying to give them a taste of some new mathematics. Okay. For, um, and I don't know if you can see this real well, but for the lesson study, one of the lesson uh, groups built their um, lesson on something from the Shell Center in Nottingham, England. And this is the calibrating bottles problem. And you can actually see it a little bit better in the second part where it's 
you're filling a bottle and you're grading, you know, how the uh, volume is. So you're grading uh, height is a function of volume, okay? And of course, if you're not careful, matching the actual containers with the graphs can be very tricky. People will mess it up, okay, even really good people. Uh, so they built an entire lesson on this, and I, the person who gave the lesson, they gave it to some of my college students, uh, middle school math specialists, and she wouldn't let me videotape the lesson, and I, to this day I regret it because it was an absolutely fantastic IBL lesson. So the last thing we did was case studies. Um, and a case study is you present them with a scenario. And this came from uh, the Harvard uh, Business School model of, you know, they do a lot of case studies. Well, one case study was uh, a student, a very bright student who missed something, and it was figuring out the area of an analyst. And he wrote down uh, 36 instead of 36 pi was the answer. And you would think that that was a typo you know, or a copy error, but the student believed, actually believed there should be no pi, uh, pi should not be in the answer. And this teacher didn't quite know how to deal with this. And so leading these case studies, what you do is uh, you always get the group going of teachers and you never make a statement, you just, well, what do you think this, what should the teacher have done here? And you get some very rich ideas. So I led the first one and then I had broke them into groups and they each of the teachers led different case studies, okay? And this was something they could take back to their schools and, or school districts and do, uh, you know, the next week for pre PD. So, so some of the resources here, uh, the Heinemann videos, that's where you can get them uh, from Heinemann. Uh, the function and graphs, it used to be very hard to get those, that, the red book, if any, has anybody seen that? Okay, there's some really neat problems in there, really good IBL problems for high school and middle school. You can now download it for free uh, from the Shell Center. And the windows on the case studies are published by K. Seth, and they're available from the teach, uh, Teachers College Press and there's an instructor's guide to go with it. So the uh, teachers had very, we asked them what, uh, we surveyed the teachers, we had 20 left, I got about 17 responses, which is pretty good, and we asked them what IBL was. They all agreed that IBL was student-centered, okay? Uh, and after that they varied a little bit, but you can read the second, uh, comment there, presenting a rich problem that the student will have to think about and will be forced to grapple with as they come up with a mathematical ideas and see how mathematical ideas fit together. The teacher facilitates the student learning by questioning and extending their knowledge. Right. So we asked them what the effectiveness of the different IBL activities was. So they thought, um, Stan's uh, little dog and pony show was, they loved it. Okay, that was by far the most effective. The taxi cab geometry, they thought it was somewhat effective, okay, um, but less than the others. They also, they liked lesson study and they liked the case studies. Okay, I'll let you briefly read the comments there, okay, uh, but they were pretty positive. So, did their viewpoint change? Yes. Okay. So, uh, did their viewpoint of mathematics change? Did their viewpoint of their students change? Well, certainly not as much. Did their viewpoint of their colleagues change? Yes. It, over the course of the program, it changed a great deal. So, this was very, very encouraging. We were accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish. They started to realize that their clients were they're now their colleagues. Okay, and uh, how am I doing on time here? Okay, so we've got uh, again. I'll let you read the comments here. 
Okay, um, I've got a couple, about four of them here. Okay, and you know, one of the other was I, I, it's, I now see my co colleagues, and remember these are good qualified teachers, less as annoyances and more as a challenge to help them succeed in their classrooms. Okay, and the, the last comment is that we did build a community. Okay, were these people challenged? Did we have set the apple cart? Okay. And I'm not sure how much you want to, with cognitive dissonance, okay, you want to create, you don't want them running out of the room screaming and, you know, dropping out of the program, but you want them a little bit uncomfortable. And I think we accomplished that. There were only, there was only one that said, I wasn't challenged at all, okay. There were a couple that were greatly challenged, but most of them were in the middle. And again, we, uh, Okay. And their comments, okay, were, it took me out of my comfort level, okay, the limit impacted my life uh, in a very positive way, so, you know, these people, and we've had a couple when the, uh, the first one, the leadership program finished a year, that grant before the limit program, we had a, at least two people who said, well, can I keep coming to the limit program? I know I'm not going to get supported anymore, but I really want to do this. Okay, so they kept coming. So, further research. Okay, is this, does this really work? I, we've got some, a start, some anecdotal evidence, a small survey, a case study, uh, but you know, I don't think we have solid evidence, and I think a lot more research uh, needs to be done. The second thing is, we now have pretty good evidence, you know, that IBL does indeed work, okay? And all of us at the conference feel it works. But we don't have a good model or theoretical model of why it works. And I think this goes into cognitive dissonance and so on, do students, you know, as they progress through their academic career, uh, you know, they take calculus, well, that's built on algebra, and they just sort of try and fit calculus into what they already know, okay? But all of a sudden, they hit proofs, okay? And successful students will make the transition to proof, but students who are not su successful, they're gonna try and take this proof class and fit it into the calculus, the algebra that they've been uh, studying all along, and it doesn't seem to be successful. And I think what IBL does there is it upsets the apple cart enough where, okay, this isn't working. I've got this idea of what I've been doing for the past 12, you know, 14 years of my college, my educational career. I've got this new way of thinking. I got to reconcile the two. And I think a lot more work needs to be done on that model. And with that, I think I'll end. Is this notion of cognitive dissonance, is that a, how widespread is that? that it's widespread in psychology. I don't think it's widespread in mathematical education. I I've mean, never, it's known. I've never heard of it, so I've, you yeah, make me feel better. It comes from psychology. Pardon? Well, anyway, anyway I feel, I feel uh, better because I, I'd, never heard, I'd never heard of it before, but it's, I, I see what you're getting at. Thanks.